Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Catherine Richdale from the University of Houston, and we're going to be speaking about astigmatism in myopia management and higher order aberration and how it affects our treatments. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We are very elated to be joined by Catherine Richdale out of the University of Houston. And uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. Thanks for having me. Yes, we're super, super stoked. So Catherine, can you give us a, a little bit of a rundown of what you do at the university right now? Um, there's just one thing or two things that you do. I see <laughs> what, what you're all involved in. So yeah. lay it out for us. I have to talk about that. I won't get into the service and the teaching and all that <laughs> stuff you're not interested in, but... Um, relevant to this, I do, since I joined here, I've helped expand the myopia management service of UH mm -hmm. and really implement more um, protocols and how we work with students and residents and um, kind of what lenses we use and billing and coding and packages and things like that. And then I um, help teach kind of some elective things around evidence-based practice. Um, and that dovetails really well with myopia management because it is yeah. so you know, um, you can't read a book, although that will be changing shortly. Um, you really need to kind of stay up to date on the literature in order to practice. Yeah, absolutely. And there's probably a couple other things that you do, too, that take up a little bit of your time. So thank you for being involved. So really, a lot of what you've done is not just this academic, like you fit lenses and do research, like you dig into the clinic, you understand from a fee perspective on how to make this work. And that's one thing I really appreciated about the, the University of Houston students, the UH students that come out, is they have a little bit better knowledge, it seems, than, than some programs on the money side. Is that something you encounter in the uh, academic setting or in the clinic setting where you talk about that, that stuff? Yeah, thanks. Um, I do think it's important to talk about that. And I you know, tell my students um, up front, I'm not an expert on practice management by any stretch of the imagination. I've never had my own practice. I've worked in a clinical practice, but I have tried a lot of things and failed with them. And so I try to share like what worked and what didn't work mm -hmm. um, and then share readings from other people I've written specifically about private practice and how they do it and kind of pros and cons. I think we're all right now just trying to figure out what works best for our own setting so I think yeah. the best I can do with our students is kind of give them all the pieces and, and let them know you're going to have to make these decisions. Um, this is why we do it here. You might yeah. want to do, do it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think an aspect of, of the conversation around money, it tends to be this, well, we didn't go into this for the money. And, you know, certainly we're here to help people. But if something doesn't generate money, we tend to shy away from it, Right. So if, if you've been burned by these patients, you know, seeing you dozens of times and you now realize you're losing money on it, you're less likely to bring it up to the next patient. I think that's a really important component in the educational perspective, but also that physicians are needing to understand is that money plays a part into this because you, you need to not lose money doing it yeah. and certainly avenues where you can gain money. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, hey, um, so you have uh, done some interesting stuff with astigmatic myopic children. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we, we, we want to just ignore that astigmatism and just talk about their myopia. But when you put a spherical contact lens on these patients, things are different than uh, if you put a toric lens, both from a soft multifocal or into an ortho case. Can you talk a little bit about your work in the astigmatic world and uh, sure. some things you've learned? Yeah. So uh, first I want to start by giving credit to my PhD student, Erin Tomiyama, who, right, this is really her baby. Yeah. And this started with us, um, gosh, almost five years ago now. Um, yeah. We're in the clinic, so we're in you know Houston, Texas. We have a very large population of Hispanic patients. Um, we see astigmatism a lot also in our Asian patients um, and, and some 
among our black patients, but it's a lot, right? We're not talking three quarters of adapter. We're talking over adapter, two adapters. Some patients have three adapters. And so right from this clinical question, what do we do with these patients? What is best for them? And right, best could be visual outcomes. Best could be efficacy. Best could be, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever the patient thinks is important to them. And so um, both of my graduate students, Erin, started looking into um, both a mix of patient-reported outcomes and efficacy and vision and the fitting process for toric orthokeratology and soft toric multifocals. And then my master's student, um, Lauren Johnson, is right doing research in the middle of a pandemic, was, was doing more surveys and looking at adults and kids and then parents of kids and their perceptions um, of ortho K and soft multifocal. So I think there's a lot more research to be done because as you said, they are ignored. All the clinical trials kind of, you know, expect, except a couple we can think of, right. Um, the two C study and, um, have just largely ignored it. And it makes sense that they ignore it because you got to figure out the simple myop first. Um, yeah, but on a day-to-day that. basis, we have multiple astigmatic patients. So to us, it's really clinically relevant and something we need yeah. answers to. Yeah. So, so one question I have for you is, does, from what you've, uh, what you understand, does it affect the myopia management uh, if you don't correct it? So if you were to put a patient in, say, an ortho K lens, and you were able to somehow get their refraction to Plano minus two, right? <laughs> this is, that wouldn't happen, but in, in a centered lens or whatever you wanted to do, like, are, are we affecting the myopia? Yeah, that's the, I think that's one the of question. the exciting questions out today. And um, Dr. Yoon, um, Gunyang Yoon, mm-hmm. who's here, is doing a lot of research on that as well. And I've tried to dig into the literature a little bit more um, as part of Aaron's PhD work. And you know, there's a mix of outcomes from animal research. There's limited clinical data. Um, there's no real understanding of how astigmatism either causes you to become more myopic or less myopic. We see associations and correlations with more myopia, more astigmatism. Um, mm-hmm. Does with the rule versus against the rule matter um, and how the retina actually detects these signals? Um, and then, as you just said, too, now we have this astigmatic child. If we correct the astigmatism or we leave it under, uncorrected, does it have the same effect? And mm-hmm. probably it is all related, right? It's like the same question about does outdoor time only help in a pre myop Probably it still helps in a myop. We just don't have good data right now, but I can't think of a physiological reason why something would help before the onset of the disease and not after. But all of these questions are unknown and I think are, are kind of the next frontier and, and where we need to go. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I do and then I'd love to hear your perspective on this. And so the way we changed our success in myopia management is we stopped focusing our primary objective on the refractive outcome uh, and started focusing on the uh, on whether or not we were getting in a soft multifocal or an ortho K as much correction as we could uh, with spherical products. We, we do correct astigmatism. So where, where we kind of went about this was our focus is to correct as much of your myopia as possible. And if there is residual astigmatism, we may give you a pair of glasses that you could wear. Or if you're for some reason not able to get into a, uh, a monthly lens and you have to be in a daily, which there isn't a daily toric multifocal that would really work in this arena, we mm-hmm. could wear spectacle lenses on top of that. And, uh, and I know that Aaron's work also focused on, and, and your master's student focused on, you know, patient's quality of life and their vision and so forth. And this, so you can speak to that. But um, really what I wanted to do is I didn't want to be focusing on, shoot, I didn't get a buck 50 a sill in this ortho K patient, therefore I failed and we need to stop all myopia management, right? Yeah. Get them as good as you can. And then if they need something more refractively, then we could do spectacle lenses. And I'm kind of curious if you, if, if, if that is a reasonable approach from what your research has said. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a good option to offer patients. I will say I don't, I haven't found myself offering it too much. 
Um, I don't know why. Um, kind of the same, you know, about partial correction and then giving them additional spectacles during the day. It's probably maybe my bias thinking they're not going to wear it or, you know, then they're just going to walk around blurry. But if it's been successful in your practice, I think that's a great option um, and really simpler probably than what we're trying to do <laughs> um, is we end up with these kids just seeing them multiple times and ordering mm. a gazillion soft torque multifocal lens. Those yeah. are high astigmats are in, in a soft torque multifocal most of the time. Right. And, and, and we have those and, and I'm comfortable okay. saying it for the, for the reason we have biofinity torque okay. multifocals, um, you know, certainly a great with the distance center that we can use for our patients. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and, and I, I was struggling with that, right. You know, how, how much quality vision should I chase in a private practice with three visits when three visits, they were 20, 30 plus mm -hmm. four visits were 20, 30, 20, 25 yeah. way minus, like, right. what did I really do? And so it, it, I became way more successful, at least in my mind of being able to say to people, and you know, there's others that are out there in the myopia world who have seen this is, is we're targeting myopia management, not refractive correction. I'm going to shoot for as much refractive correction, but I'm not going to consider myself a failure if I don't get it. And then yeah. we're going to be able to, and part of the other funny thing is, and, and you could speak to this probably as well with as many patients as you see, the patient comes in 2050 and they're fine. fine. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and then you do myopia management on them and they miss a letter on the 2020 line and their parents are like, Oh my, they can't see anything. Right. It's like, well, your kid was like, four times worse than those when they yeah. came in, right? And that's exactly the point. So we do have some, I mean, for across the board, 99% of our kids are fine with some blur. I can think of one child who comes to sure. see us often and wants a quarter of that change. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. And it really does come down to, as you said, educating and re-educating, I think, some parents, not everyone, on this is expected. This is normal. And I think sometimes it's kind of just like in anything, setting yourself up for success is, you know, setting the expectations. And so we do say when we go through our consult, you know, any of these options could cause some blur. That's normal. It's kind of, a, you know, considered a side effect. They'll still function well. They'll still do well. We'll make sure to change things if they, you know, are saying they can't see the board or can't drive if they're older and, you know, doing their driving lesson mm -hmm. like that. But you're right. I agree. 2020 should not be the end all be all of yeah. failure and success for sure. Yeah. Well, that leads us into this next topic that I wanted to talk with you about is when I do orthokeratology, I'd love to tell you that every single fit is perfect. <laughs> um, but you know, there's been one or two that hasn't been <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, the patient's happy with it. And I look at the fit and I'm like, you know, they're seeing 2020 ish, 2025, uh, you know, refractively, they're not taking a ton more, um, but this lens is decentered, and you know the patient doesn't report of glare halos, but I know that they're getting some, and it's this induced higher order aberration that we're getting, and uh, I, I, I've, I've come to realize that maybe that's a good thing. Is that true? Yeah. So I probably have a lot to say on this because <laughs> <laughs> good. That's the right person. Well, I've had people come up to me after my CE and, and kind of feel shame and blame and horrible that they're not, you know, getting a perfectly centered treatment zone within the pupil and that is sustained, you know, for 18 hours a day and there's no complaints of anything. Because I think sometimes the CEs make it seem like this, right? And here's our perfect example, right? And they don't all look like that. And, and it's fine. Um, uh -huh. It's not it's not that we can't strive for something with the hypothesis that maybe having a slightly smaller treatment zone, who knows if centered or decentered is better or not, right? These are all great hypotheses and I think they're worth continuing to research and discuss, mm -hmm. but you're still doing a good thing if you're putting a patient in ortho K and they're seeing well enough to go through school and do things, you're still getting efficacy. Um, it's the next level if we wanna try to, you know, get them to, you know, who knows what the ultimate level of efficacy is? Normal emetropic growth? Sure. We still don't fully understand what that is at what age. And Yeah. You know. But we do know 
correct me if I'm wrong, that higher order aberrations may oh, actually right. be a good thing. And, yeah. uh, and, and how, how do, how do we maximize the benefit with inducing higher order aberrations? Yeah. Can we do that? So, um, right. It's easy to just tell parents and everybody that it's plus in the periphery that helps. And it's a nice story, but I am a believer that it's not just that. And we kind of see hints of that when we look at different lens designs and outcomes and Aaron's work looked at both peripheral refraction and higher order aberrations in patients fitted with soft torque multivocals and torque orthokeratology. Forget the torque for right now. Um, but, okay. Right. But ortho K gave more peripheral um, plus in the periphery, more um, mapic to focus and greater higher order aberrations. And I can't say for sure, you know, is one icing on the cake and it just adds better efficacy or what it is that the retina is detecting, but we know we don't have like plus detectors. So um, is it sphere collaboration? And with ortho K we're inducing greater sphere collaboration and therefore it's better efficacy. We're just not measuring it, right? We've been measuring peripheral refraction. We don't have a great way. I mean, people are doing it, measuring peripheral sphere collaboration and other things. It's complicated. Um, so sometimes, right, we start with the simplest thing and we know that that works, but we don't fully understand the mechanism. We just know that it works. Um, and then yeah, we continue well, to kind of refine why it works and what are the yeah. differences in these lens designs. And, and I think that's kind of one of those things is, you know, we might have, you know, certain populations where they don't do a great ortho K fitting, but yet they're still slowing down the progression of nearsightedness for our patients. For sure. Maybe and there's so many other, yeah. Probably benefit. why. Right. So many other benefits of just wearing ortho K and not having lenses during the day and whatnot. So, right. We kind of miss the forest for the tree sometimes when we get so focused on this like somewhat unattainable um, level of perfection on all of the patients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's phenomenal information. I think uh, the takeaway that I have from this is uh, maybe I don't have to be as perfect as I've always thought. Uh, your work has really helped us understand um, that, uh, that, that getting better means that we're getting more patients into myopia management. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and although we're striving for visual performance as best as we can, it really needs to be our secondary objective with our patients in soft multifocals or in orthokeratology uh, by, by and large. And, uh, and some incredible work. Uh, what, what are you anticipating coming out here in the future with astigmatic correction and higher order aberrations? What's the future look like? Yeah, there's a lot more to do. Aaron's now um, looking at some of our data on how it affects accommodation and phoria, because again, I think, you know, again, we have a lot of people right, who come in and are um, basic exos or have CIs and all these binocular vision issues that I think affects their efficacy. And then you put them in a lens, which makes them more exo. And so, yep, that's our next plan. But for anybody out there that wants to do more research in the astigmats, there's lots to be done, um, mm -hmm. both in ortho K and, um, you know, getting a, a different design options of soft torque multifocals. Yeah. Yeah. Any closing comments? I appreciate you being on the show. No, yeah, thanks for coming. It's been fun to yeah. follow along and you've had some great people on. So thanks for doing this. And yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode of the myopia podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.